Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel on 2FGBTQ plus health policy in Canada, uh, featuring our fantastic panel of experts, advocates, and researchers, uh, including Nick Boyce from the Ontario Harm Reduction Network, Dr. Dr. Omisha Ray Dryden from Dalhousie University, uh, Dr. Cameron McKenzie from Wilfrid Laurier University, and Ryan Peck uh, from HELCO, the HIV AIDS Legal Clinic of Ontario. Uh, my name is Michael Quagg, and I'm the Director of Knowledge Exchange and Policy Development at the Community Based Research Centre. I'm joining today's session from Tech Toronto, the traditional and unceded territory of the Wendat, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Metis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and that I'm privileged uh, to be able to live and work on these lands as an advocate and uh, researcher for the health and well being of two spirit, queer, trans, and non binary people across Turtle Island. Um, I'm pleased to be one of the moderators for today's panel. And I'm joined uh, also by Greg Owens from the Regional HIV AIDS Connection in London, who will also be co moderating with me. Uh, welcome, Greg. Um, so for today, uh, this panel features uh, some critical analysis on four key policy issues impacting 2SGBTQ plus folks in Canada, including queer identities and health equity, uh, drug decriminalization, HIV criminalization, and the implications of anti-Black homophobia and transphobia on health policy. Uh, I think this is a really timely discussion to be talking about 2SGBTQ plus health policy, given uh, the new federal government in Ottawa uh, after uh, last September's election. Um, but we've also got the provincial and municipal elections uh, in Ontario coming up next year. Um, and also just, you know, thinking about um, the last 20 months uh, that we've been dealing with COVID and, you know, thinking about all the different um, sort of opportunities um, for policy um, uh, so innovation and addressing some long-standing structural problems in our health and social system. So you know, everything from uh, safer supply initiatives and drug decriminalization as responses to the overdose crisis, um, some follow-up work around HIV criminalization and uh, just thinking about the federal LGBTQ2 plus action plan, uh, which has been lauded uh, and heralded by the federal government. Uh, and they promised to actually table that uh, within their first 100 days in office, uh, reflecting you know, their strategy to support LGBTQ2 communities. So uh, with those introductory remarks, uh, I'm excited to uh, introduce our first uh, panelist and uh, presenter today, uh, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, who is an assistant professor uh, at the Faculty of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier University. Over to you, Cameron. Great, I'm just going to share my screen. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Okay, great. So today I'll be talking about 2SGB MSN well-being policy and the next steps for community action. So before I'd like to begin, it's important that we acknowledge that uh, today and right now I'm just near Wilfrid Laurier, so we meet on the traditional lands of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. As settlers on this land, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the history of violence that's led to the establishment of this city and country. And we recognize that many of us continue to benefit from the histories of colonization and the acts of colonization continue to this day. We also recognize that it's our duty to treat the land with respect as original people of these territories once did and continue to do so. And as we work towards building a more inclusive community, let us not forget the privileges afforded to us due to the continued occupation of these territories. Oops. All right, so I need a bit of help here. Hoping I can ask the audience, feel free to use the chat, uh, feel free to raise your hand or just maybe just call it out. But everyone in this room is an expert when it comes to health and equities that the queer and, ch queer and trans community faces. So what are, you know, what are some things you're seeing on the ground? What are you seeing uh, at your place of work?
Access to PrEP, yeah, for sure. Uh, coverage issues, that was a big thing that came out out of this study that folks were sharing with us. Even just the process to get on PrEP uh, within the challenges. HIV treatment, yeah. Access for uh, international students, for sure. Lack of culture competency, that was another big piece. Again, not just with, um, we're seeing kind of that with also service providers, and social workers, nurses, uh, doctors. Again, not understanding, for example, queer and trans issues to other cultural issues as well the community faces. But I think we all would agree, right? The well being of 2S, GB, MSN, uh, you know, faces serious population specific health issues. Oops, my apologies. Um, you know, including risk, as folks are saying, HIV and AIDS, STIs, high rates of mental health, anxiety, depression, suicide, and so forth. And specifically, when we look at the trans community, right, again, we're seeing specific, you know, uh, issues of transphobia, uh, you know, microaggressions within the healthcare setting. And of course, this puts them in higher risk for poor health outcomes, and also, you know, reduces the likelihood that they're going to engage with healthcare service providers as folks are kind of sharing with us today. And of course, the lack of training with uh, healthcare professionals. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about this study. So this study was in partnership with the uh, GMSH, right? It's a member-based coalition of AIDS service organizations and other organizations concerned with 2SGB uh, MSN. And as you already know, right, it's a community hub, right, for learning, capacity building, and advocacy. So as the GMSH is working with its funders and with its policymakers, it feels that now is a time to mobilize. Okay, let's kind of get back in terms of what we did. So what do we do? Well, the purpose was to help the GMSH, right, develop resources and programs. So again, what we were doing here was kind of three things to document 2SGB uh, well-being from the perspectives of um, people like yourselves, uh, right, who serve our community. We also wanted to identify uh, organizational barriers and lastly, provide evidence to support uh, change. So what do we do? Sorry, it looks like my keyboard just stopped working there for a second. All right, so we used two main methods, right? The first involved environmental scan of 50 governmental uh, agencies and policies and initiatives at the provincial and federal level, as well as community um, uh, programs across the 36 GMSH member organizations. And so for our environmental scan, we examined um, you know, sections of web pages that belong to relevant Ontario ministries that refer to uh, mental health. We also looked at provincial mandate strategies, federal departments, national agencies, Ontario agencies, and lastly, the Ontario public health units. Then we conducted six main focus groups with Alliance members from the GMSH. And the focus groups, again, came from a lot of meetings and consultations with board members from the GMSH. Again, we shared our technical report, so in our technical report, our, our brief environmental scan back with you in, I think, September and August of 2020. And I'll briefly show that in the next slide, some of our findings. And our work produced recommendations that was informed by focus groups, uh, participants like many of you who are attending today. All right, so some of you probably remember this. This is what we shared, like I said, last summer. And this was just a quick visual of what the environmental scan looked like for the ASOs and how they're addressing 2S uh, GB MSN. And we can see, for example, right, we have 57% again are addressing issues like mental health, around 43% uh, targeting you know, programs for the queer and trans community. Let's get into the main findings, what the study was finding. And we kind of found three uh, main um, importing um, aspects when it came to well-being needs. So the well-being needs of 2S, GB, MSN are not being met. In particular, there is a gap in the framework that outlines the social determinants of health specific to this group. 
And most community agencies, so roughly 61%, uh, offered some type of programming specific to 2S GB MSN. Again, here was mainly focused on outreach, um, educational activities, and often applying harm reduction approaches. Now, all the focus group participants told us there was many gaps in the wellness needs for 2S GB MSN. Specifically, there was a lack of, of services plus barriers of asking the few that actually do exist, right? And this was just as people were sharing the chat, right? Uh, you know, getting prep and healthcare providers who feel a discomfort or even negative attitude towards uh, same-sex relationships. Now, what was also, um, we found out in the study, there was also more gaps that appear more prominent in rural and even suburban areas. All right, organizational barriers. So in our study, participants told us that there was a high turnover rate in the workplace. And the average number of years was around four years and a median of about two. That is, about half of the participants had worked in the roles for less than two years. BIPOC communities continue to face marginalization and are underserved. Focus groups identified key populations is often missing when it comes to the well-being resources uh, for certain groups. And this was trans, non-binary individuals, BIPOC, immigrants, and people with disabilities. And many participants identified a major lack of expertise within the organization to properly address the needs of these communities. And another major challenge was organizational barriers because of competing viewpoints of management versus frontline staff. And I'm gonna share one quote uh, today with you about one of the participants shared with us regarding these organizational barriers. And they said, I don't think we put out as many mission statements, as many position statements. I don't think we've signed as many petitions. And I don't think we've reached out to as many politicians as we should have, because it's always this. We don't want to rock the boat. And if you're asking the community to trust you with their health and wellness needs, but you're also not willing to speak to the powers that show that you're willing to advocate for them, then I think that puts you in a very delicate situation. So, and not surprisingly, funding was also a major factor in being able to address the needs of their clients, especially when it comes to the social determinants of health. Uh, many participants describe concerns about balancing clients' needs and funder expectations, mainly in resource limited contexts. Okay, and then one of our last big major findings was the policy limitations. Well, almost all participants struggled to identify any provincial or federal health policy specific to 2S GB MSN. This is consistent with the gap found in our environmental scan. Now, some participants described the few existing policies as ineffective in addressing the needs of this community. Furthermore, these policies tend to be singularly focused. They do not consider intersectionality and multiple marginal identities. Now, as a side note, the COVID pandemic has shed light on these structural oppressions that underlines these policy limitations, especially for trans non-binary individuals and BIPOC. And of course, the final theme was the GMSH was doing a great job that supports educational outreach work that service providers like you engage in. Now, some participants made specific recommendations for policy, like decriminalizing um, drugs and launching a national pharmacare program. So we need to rekindle the lost art of advocacy. The majority of participants felt uh, ill-equipped to advocate for policy change. And this is what our next project will be on, and I'll talk about it more in just a minute. Let's just briefly talk about the discussion. Well, this study identified three areas of need from the community service provider's point of view. So the first one here, we have the needs from the GMSH. Well, participants alluded to the desire to continue growing 
and learning within their roles. Participants wanted more opportunity to engage and collaborate with Alliance members. Specifically, they mentioned the need for more educational resources and a needs assessments for Alliance members. Needs of funders. While the current competitive funding model was specifically identified as a major barrier, it can actually be harmful for wellness programming because it favors larger organizations. And lastly, the need for policymakers. Well, once again, the well-being needs of the 2S LGBTQ plus community are not being met. And to avoid imposing heteronormative notions of health and wellness needs on this population, there needs to be a population specific approach to policy. Now, one such heteronormative notion is the conflation of gender and sexual orientation as a social determinant of health. That is the social determinants of health. Yeah, we've got here too, right? yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So that is the social determinant of health associated with sexual orientation and uh, gender identity and expression are currently subsumed under gender, which does not adequately recognize the unique needs of our community. And finally, participants express frustration that community level expertise was not recognized by funders or policymakers. All right, so these are just some brief recommendations I put out. Again, the uh, official report that's has, okay. How's it going? Uh, cool. I'm in the middle of yet another meeting. Has, uh, has been shared. Um, uh, sorry. So here's some recommendations. One being the provincial and need for a federal uh, LGBTQ plus health specific policy. Again, there's going to be better funding opportunities. Sorry, not better funding opportunities, better funding to adequately compensate uh, workers, workers like you who work at ASOs. Again, we need to address the broader social terms of health for funding programming. We need a specific trans uh, programming for policymakers. And lastly, again, education to empower Alliance members to advocate for this population. And I'm going to talk about that next. Again, the full version of the report has now been uh, shared by the GMSH, and I have more recommendations. I thought I'd just, with time, share, I think, the top five. All right, so in collaboration with the GMSH, we'll be submitting a grant to host a two-day symposium and all Alliance members are invited. So the main goal is to provide practical skills for mobilization. And as you know, the Canadian queer movement is relatively dormant these days. And as you told us, right, there's a crisis for wellness services and policy along with a sense of not knowing what to do about it. And more broadly, how to advocate for social change at the structural level. So we'll be reaching back to the 1970s Canadian Gay Liberation Movement, which sought enduring social justice by challenging major social and economic structures that addresses oppression, again, for marginalized communities. So I believe a structural approach is timely in consideration of the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the queer community and on other marginalized communities. So within QLT or queer liberation theory as a guide, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, combined with the experiences of activists, presenters, we'll work together to learn practical skills to address the current crisis and the social determinants of health behind it. Okay, so what is QLT? Well, I think there's kind of three important tenets to talk about when we talk about queer liberation theory, and that's anti-assimilationism, solidarity across movements, and political economy. So anti-assimilationism is kind of like anti-conformity. So it's a response to the mainstreaming and sanitation of radical queer sexual culture. Solidarity across movements, well, this is kind of a collectivist, a collectivist call for direct action, for social change, for all marginalized groups. And QLT offers an intersectional lens. And finally, political economy is about economic inequity. The gap between rich and poor, QLT challenges political and economic structures to create equity for everyone. So, for example, the annual Gay Pride event 
right? Once a radical political demonstration has become mainstream into a business family friendly celebration of gayness. Okay, just kind of to wrap this up. As I just said, you know, we want to produce a mobilization toolkit for structural change for queer liberation. So one piece we want to do is create practical tools and skills for the community for mobilization and social change. So we want to have guest speakers and people doing workshops on how can you influence policy. We're going to have a journalist, for example, talk about how do you talk to the media, right? Providing like an elevator pitch, right? Making sure this is hands-on um, sessions you're taking, not just kind of like a lecture where someone's just listening. It has to be clear, you know, interactive and fit for your needs. Another piece is how to organize a campaign, how to get your message across from Queen's Park. For example, one of the uh, speakers we have is a former member of Parliament and using her, kind of her expertise of getting messages across from her time within the queer movement. And we also want to make sure that this, the toolkit includes a summary of, of course, the presentations. We want to con you know, contextualize this within a queer liberation framework. And lastly, we want this to again benefit again, the queer community, and again, apply to all marginalized communities. So again, this toolkit will be shared through many, channel, uh, many channels, sorry, uh, such as community forums, um, you know, starting with the GMSH first. And finally, we want to have an um, animated uh, infograph, which will be shared on um, social media, as well as a technical report and a few other things. So again, making sure that what people learn from this uh, symposium can be brought back afterwards to imply uh, for others who are within the Alliance and, of course, people who are outside Alliance members. Okay, so that's kind of a bit of a, what I was sharing today, talking a little bit about the 2S uh, GB MSN well-being from the context of the previous PEG study that we just did, and then talking about kind of the next steps moving forward of what to do about it. Thanks for uh, watching. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um... Uh, for just sharing the results of that research and those consultations. And uh, I got to say that today's symposium sounds amazing, and I um, really look forward to hearing more about it. Um, would love to be involved. Um, so um, before we transition to our next uh, speaker and presentation, I just realized that I forgot to sort of review the plan for uh, the session. And um, I just wanted to note to everyone that each of the panelists were given about 15 to 20 minutes uh, to present. Uh, and then we were going to hold uh, all the audience uh, questions until the end, uh, about like the final sort of 10 to 15 minutes. But unfortunately, um, Cameron has to leave early. And so I uh, wanted to just give folks an opportunity to uh, raise any uh, comments or questions uh, for uh, Dr. McKenzie and, um, and uh, yeah, see if there's any sort of uh, interest in sort of following up on anything that uh, Cameron had presented. Okay, I'm guessing that there aren't. So I think um, if folks do uh, have comments or questions, uh, please do feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, and uh, for now, I will just introduce our next speaker. Uh, so we are very lucky to have uh, Dr. Omi Sheree Dryden uh, with us, who is the James R. Johnson Chair uh, in Black Canadian Studies at the Faculty of Medicine and Associate Professor uh, with the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at uh, Dalhousie University. Um, Dr. Dryden is also the co-lead of the Black Health Education Collaborative. Um, Dr. Dryden, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, uh, Cameron, Dr. McKenzie. I appreciated uh, your uh, presentation and uh, uh, your uh, discussion with queer liberation uh, analytics. So thank you for that. <clears throat> I know we've been doing this for about 20 months, but I still get nervous sharing my screen. So let's, let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay. 
And like most of you, I've been working a lot on my desktop, so my desktop is a mess. All right. Um, I hope to be about 21 minutes, so let me get started. And I'm open for, uh, let me just open my chat in case I need to there see anything. All right, great. So uh, thanks for everyone who uh, were involved in pulling this together, organizing things like this. is a lot of labor, so thank you. I currently uh, live, work, and study in Chibukta, Califax, the traditional unceded territory of the Maliseet, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. Yes, we must not forget that these treaties were signed roughly 140 years before the end of slavery in this region now called Canada. Halifax was imposed upon Tuktuk in 1749, and it was enslaved African people who were used to dig out the roads and build the city, including much of the citadel. On the southern shore of Bedford Basin, Mi'kmaq community shared land with Black people, and this allowed Africville uh, to be uh, founded in the mid 1800s. And as we know, um, Africville was demolished by the city government in uh, the 1960s, bulldozed in the middle of the night. <clears throat> uh, bulldozed in the middle of the night. Uh, in this acknowledgement, I honor Indigenous and Black people who continue to be here and who continue to fight against genocide and the afterlives of slavery. I respectfully acknowledge our collective ancestors, Indigenous, Black, queer, trans, genderqueer, and two-spirit who were born here, forced here, and continue to make home here. So yes, uh, uh, Dr. Omishree Dryden, that's who I am. <laughs> I'm a Black queer femme and the James Robinson Johnston Chair in Black Canadian Studies in the Faculty of Med. Um, uh, and I just wanted to briefly state that the uh, chair is named after Mr. James Robinson Johnston, who was an African American, sorry, an African Nova Scotian man and the first African Nova Scotian person to earn a Dalhousie degree in 1896, uh, and the first African Nova Scotian person to graduate from any university in uh, Canada. And he was the first Black lawyer to practice law in Nova Scotia. He died tragically in 1915, just days before his 39th birthday. Uh, and it's been 30 years uh, since the establishment of the Johnston Endowment and the 25th year since the um, first appointed uh, Johnston chair. And so it, it is the name of my chair. So I always speak about him uh, and talk about uh, his, um, his accomplishments. I am a scholar and a researcher and my scholarship resides in the areas of black studies, specifically black, queer and trans diasporic analytics, blood and blood donation. And I mention this because it's important uh, to be informed how I approach my research. I've been asked to speak about my funded research project, but it should be noted that this that my work in this area began long before I received grant money um, and continues uh, to continue this project. Uh, in this, in my particular work on blood and blood donation, I explore how racist homophobic stereotypes of HIV and AIDS continue to negatively stigmatize and impact black queer and trans people and black gay and bisexual men, cis and trans in blood donation protocols and systems in Canada, including Hema Quebec and Canadian Blood Services. As we know, Black Studies is rooted in radical political activist movements. Um, and Black Studies is to make sense of, to document, and to engage the terms, conditions, and manifestations of Black life in Canada in its broadest possible sense. Black feminist theory and Black queer theory, uh, where I center my methodologies, helps us to better understand the various forms of oppression um, uh, taken, uh, that various forms of oppression takes upon our lives. Um, we continue to work for the disruption of the single story, whether we're talking about a woman's experience, a black experience, or in this case, a gay experience. This type of singularity also makes itself evident uh, in various protocols and science studies and uh, social science studies. So it becomes a big deal then that feminists, including black feminists, um, have challenged the objectivity of science and thus reveal that science facts are collectively created in the pursuit of normative truths. For many, they remain stuck in the belief that the su subject is simple, singular, a simple and a singular point of knowledge production, even though we are complex um, 
uh, beings with experiences, complex bodies, and social relations. So the single story, uh, the simple story is um, ultimately is understood as the um, uh, objective story. And any deviation from this simplicity becomes dismissed as subjective and therefore unreliable. So what is it about blood? Um, when I'm talking about blood, I'm talking about this life uh, maintaining fluid that moves through our vessels of a circulatory system and provides 8% um, of our body's weight, roughly. It runs through the entire body, through our veins, arteries, and capillaries. capillaries um, and the knowledge that blood, uh, and this knowledge that blood circulates wasn't always understood that way, was detected in 1628. Um, soon after blood transfusions were attempted. So there's many centuries of practice and experimentation around blood transfusions. In humans, blood includes plasma, the liquid portion, blood cells, which come in both red and white varieties, and cell fragments uh, called platelets. Blood carries nourishment, electrolytes, hormones, vitamins, antibodies, heat, oxygen, and immune cells to bodily systems. Blood also carries waste matter and carbon dioxide away from body tissues. Blood appears uniformly red. Uh, um, it, 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 it visually looks red. Um, and under a microscope is where it's revealed the various mixtures and um, uh, pieces of the whole. Um, so blood is a medicine. Uh, it can save or sustain life when taken from one's, uh, it can sustain or uh, save or sustain life uh, when taken from one body and transfused into another. According to the Mayo Clinic, blood transfusion is a routine medical procedure in which donated blood is provided through a narrow tube placed in one's veins and one's arms. So it's blood transfusions, as we may know, are used for a variety of reasons to replace blood loss uh, due to surgery or injury or to supplement one's own internal blood supply if there are difficulties producing blood. But blood is not only biomedical, it is also socio-political. Blood has always held deep uh, social and political significance, um, most notably when it moves outside of the body in both voluntary and involuntary ways. Blood exits the body through menstruation, at birth, um, uh, through violence, including police violence, through trauma or disease, um, and uh, through wounds. So my work explores um, and, can, and identifies the extractive politics of blood. Um, and I focus on this because uh, stories told about blood and the beliefs that we hold about blood um, be, can, are also the cornerstone for Black life and Black queer and trans life. Thus, commitments to Black life and Black queer and trans uh, liberation must also engage blood talk. Blood remains an active metaphor deploy, deployed in determining our lives. And when we are engaged in activist organizing for justice, conversations about blood that moves through our bodies and the messages embedded within require further interrogation and engagement. So in my book, which I'm currently finishing, I outline uh, the colonial significations of blood, of blood narratives and an assessment of blood donation in Canada and how anti-Black racism, anti-Black homophobia and transphobia um, have been erased from the stories told about blood donation in Canada. In this way, the cultural and biomedical are brought into view with the demand for different types of methods and analytics. There is a disconnect with how blood is present in our daily discursive um, practices and how we do and do not think about blood uh, defining, uh, defining uh, how we move in our lives. My work isn't about the easiest way to uh, include blood into our current blood donation systems. My work identifies the systems of anti-Black homophobia and transphobia so that when we are included, in uh, blood donation, we are able to identify how our inclusion remains precarious and conditional. So um, anti-Black homophobia, transphobia and Canadian and Canada's blood donor system. So many may be familiar with these questions from the donor questionnaire that identify this separation of race from sexuality. Um, and this separation was treated uh, in a way to construct gay men as not being African Caribbean or black and to treat those born in or living in Africa as not queer. 
And as I stated earlier, um, I've always worked for the disruption of the single story, even when this disruption um, is dismissed as, um, uh, as unimportant. Uh, um, yes. We're also familiar with these images um, uh, used on the donor questionnaire <clears throat> um, it to, to um, uh, you know, personify what was meant by blood from, well, there's actually, you know, to read into um, what is meant by African blood, queer African blood, uh, to really kind of identify, you know, focus on uh, these kinds of racist imagery. So I've been engaged in research activism and, and destruction from Canadian, uh, with Canadian Blood Services in Hema, Quebec since 1999, uh, around 1999 and 2000. I was awarded the MSM research grant in 2015, sorry, 2017, bringing uh, with me my almost 20 years at that time research experience to the, fund, to the project. So it's so I identify this because health is often imagined as rational, apolitical, um, and as a technically operated and institutional regulative uh, regulatory principles uh, that are used to define illness and disease. Sorry, okay, the belief that science is objective and medicine is colorblind fuels the belief that to engage in the work of equity means to sacrifice excellence, and this is patently false. There is a belief that claiming a colorblind stance, one is actively engaged in treating people equally by demonstrating that uh, race does not matter. However, colorblindness does nothing to address racism. See the elephant in the room. Um, racism is always present regardless of whether or not one notices. When racism, racial harassment, and racial discrimination occur, to claim a colorblind stance uh, tends to individualize the conflict between two people and considers the racism a shortcoming, uh, something one can be educated out of, and does not examine the larger picture, the systemic structure that allows racial harassment and discrimination to occur uninterrupted. Colorblindness comes from a lack of awareness of white privilege and white people can guiltlessly subscribe to colorblindness because they are usually unaware of how racism impacts the lives of black and indigenous people and people of color. So my project was not to prove that there's racism in blood donation. We already, uh, that was that when you center um, critical race theory um, and black queer diasporic analytics, you understand that racism already always existed. Um, my project was to do something new, was to actually center black queer, uh, black gay and bisexual men, cis and trans, <clears throat> their experiences with uh, blood donation, and not as, um, you know, not slipped in as part of a larger population study, not slipped in um, as, you know, oh, well, well, like, let's, let's pretend we're being fully um, uh, inclusive and diverse, but really to center, um, to uh, center the experiences of Black queer and trans people and Black queer and trans men. Uh, so this is my research team. Uh, it was funded by the MSM Research Project. Uh, our project wrapped in July, 2021. Um, yes. Uh, the, for participant eligibility, uh, we uh, focused on four centers, Halifax, Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. You had to be um, over the age of 17 in Halifax, Ottawa, and Toronto, over the age of 18 in Montreal identifies male, a man or a gender not conforming and someone who has sex with male, a man or someone who's, um, uh, uh, and someone who's uh, identifies as male or as a man, um, and of course be black. Um, these are, uh, this is what we were hoping to get. This is what we got. Um, uh, it happened over a period of time with lots of life things happening, including um, the pandemic. Uh, in this is just some of the early data. I'm going to move through this quickly. I'm happy to answer more questions at the end in terms of how people defined uh, their sex at birth and um, how they uh, identified at the time of answering the survey. 
Uh, some of our major accomplishments, uh, question 30 from the donor questionnaire was removed. They removed this question after awarding me the funding, I think assuming that that meant that issues of racism were no longer a concern or issues of racial harassment, uh, racial homophobia, racist homophobia were not concerned. Um, because of um, a number of factors, we had to create new research methods um, in order to reach out to black, gay, uh, black, gay and bisexual men and minosexist men uh, that would work in rural communities in Halifax, uh, in and around the Halifax Regional Municipality, and that would work uh, in smaller centers like um, Ottawa. Uh, in total, though, if this becomes um, to date, and I'm happy to be proven wrong here, of uh, the largest, uh, the study that um, uh, works with the largest participants of Black, gay, bisexual men. And of course, um, what was happening in our project was raised on the Senate floor on June 16th, 2021 um, by Senator Wanda Thomas-Bernard. I don't have the time to play the video here. Um, our recommendations um, uh, that there be account accountability for anti-Black homophobia, that they move to a gender neutral behavior based donor screening. There is a claim that they are going to be doing that. Something e easy that they could do is really just remove the male female designations. For example, um, have you ever been pregnant? And then they put female, that's unnecessary. You could just ask. Um, and then uh, actually focus specifically on anti black homophobia, not their claim to address systemic, systemic racism. So, really um, uh, working with a consultant who has expertise. They re recently hired a consultant um, uh, that did not have that did not have any expertise in addressing systemic racism or in anti racism, um, but they continue to release their report. So as I wrap up, I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yes, um, we had our symposium and uh, project uh, presentation in June 25th, uh, on June 25th, 2021. Here are the links that you can find through the God Blood to Give uh, Facebook group. Uh, feel free to watch that. Um, it was, we have a lot more information there. And then just to, am I there? Oh, and this, these are one of the slides uh, from the presentation. These are just some of the folks that we were involved with uh, across the country, uh, across um, uh, Ontario, uh, Quebec and Nova Scotia. It was in June, so hence happy pride. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, Black, uh, uh, Black Studies is a necessary intervention when we're thinking about medical education, public health and discussions in blood and blood donation. Um, uh, these, these areas do not live outside of culture. Its development happened and continues to happen in social and cultural ways. Um, so this, these interrogations are necessary and the, the myth of a racist free donor, um, donor protocols and donor practices um, has and can prove, can and has proven deadly. It's important to explore the ways that representation is used to explicitly teach, learn, practice, and experience, um, whether it's donation, medicine, or other things. Um, so addressing anti-Black racism and anti-Black homophobia and transphobia in health and donor protocols um, means uh, disrupting these claims of uh, culture and racial neutrality, as I said earlier. We really need to be aware of the system uh, uh, decision maker or friend um, who claims proudly that they do not see color. Anytime you hear that note, you are in danger. Uh, the development of a multiculturalistic uh, logic suggests that the systems that we that are established are actually good systems, and this really is not the case. Um, when we center multiculturalism, what it does is it moves away any kind of solid interrogation into anti-Black racism or anti-Black homophobia. Um, uh, as I've discussed elsewhere, history shows that white supremacist colonial states um, strategically desire our inclusion, um, but largely um, as a way to further um, racist agendas. So I just want to conclude by drawing from Drs. Moya Bailey and Whitney Peoples in their 2017 article on Black Feminist Health Science Studies, in which they argue towards a theory that builds on social justice science with a focus on health and well-being of marginalized groups. They provide us with a reminder of Fannie Lou Hamer's statement of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, and she, and reminding us that not only was she feeling that through activism, but she was actually also feeling that in her body. Um, physical and mental health remains a metric for understanding both the process and impact of oppression on black, queer and trans people. 
Um, uh, so instead of attempting to squeeze in black gay and bisexual men into a simple study of HIV and blood donation, I deliberately, as I said, began my research by centering the experiences and lives of black gay and bisexual men. I drew and created methods of research that reflected black gay and bisexual men in different locations across various provinces in Canada. And I have been thinking about what a fulsome response and direction that CBS and blood protocols need in this country where black gay and bisexual men are not an afterthought or a footnote or worse yet, not enough data um, to be considered in outcomes or recommendations. Um, so why is blood important? As I said, it's a life source, true, but how do we understand its purpose, use, and animation? Um, the stories told about blood and the beliefs about blood can tell us also, um, and what blood can tell us are also cornerstone for Black life. Thus, commitments to Black life, Black queer life, Black trans life, and liberation must also engage blood talk, as I said. When we are engaged in activist organizing for justice, conversations about blood that move through our bodies and the messages embedded within require further interrogation um, and engagement. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, um, or if you want to reach out to me, um, uh, this is my email address, check me out on Twitter if we don't have time today. And I'm happy to talk about more data in the Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Dryden, um, for sharing your, your work with us so generously. And uh, I just, you know, really value um, the truly intersectional and community-based uh, uh, work and scholarship that you are bringing to this important issue and helping to really ensure that, you know, um, the advocacy that's being done right now around, um, you know, Canada Blood Services Policy is actually uh, incorporating um, the lens around anti-Black homophobia and transphobia, so thank you. Um, I want to uh, move along to our next uh, presenter today, uh, Nick Boyce, uh, who is uh, the director of the Ontario Harm Reduction Network. Um, and yeah, we're getting a little bit short on time, so we will sort of um, make sure to sort of give you an update uh, a minute or two before you need to wrap up. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, just checking, you can see my slide there. Mm. No, I, not yet. Can you guys see my slides? We can. We can. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, just uh, uh, I will talk quickly because I know we're running short on time, um, and this is also an incredibly complicated topic. Uh, so I will just throw some stuff at you, uh, leave you with a bunch of resources, uh, and you can go away and do a bit more homework. Um, I'm just quickly on with the Ontario Harm Reduction Network, and I just want to shout out to Kim Trenchard and Ned Kornberg, who are my uh, two teammates over at ORN, who really helped me uh, big time. And we do uh, knowledge exchange training education around harm reduction. Uh, we work across the province, um, uh, but uh, today I am located on the tr tr traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin peoples. Harm reduction takes into account the specific context of the areas where we work. We recognize these contexts are fundamentally shaped by the historic and contemporary presence and activities of Indigenous peoples. These contexts are also influenced by colonial, racist, and classist drug laws and policies. While those of us working in harm reduction support individual people who use drugs in their communities, we must also address the un and change the unjust systems that continue to negatively and disproportionately affect Indigenous peoples. So today I'm going to give you a very quick overdo overview of the overdose and poisoning and drug policy crisis, uh, talk about some of the impacts of that, uh, look at who's calling for decriminalization, and then what do we actually mean by that, look at some different models. I'm going to uh, leave a bunch of resources and links throughout in, and uh, I will share these slides after the fact so you can go away and look at those in more detail. Quickly, uh, just a quick poll here. Andrea, you have to pull that up for me. Oh, that's poll number, well, sorry, I've mixed them around. Uh, okay, let's just start with this one. <laughs> Um, if you are working with gay, bi, trans, other men that sex have men, uh, do you believe you have a role in advocating for the decriminalization of drug use?
All right. Well, maybe we have a more informed audience. Um, that's okay. That's nice to see. Uh, maybe we're not sure. Maybe we have a good idea of what decriminalization is. We'll get into that. Okay. Um, and maybe we can pull up the next poll. Yeah, I can do that. Nope. Okay. Uh, so given the violence, physical dependency, and social issues often associated with alcohol, uh, society would do better to make it illegal. So I often ask this question and get people to, to think about that because it's a legal drug, but uh, you know, it's one of the most dangerous in terms of what it does to the body, the, the associated behaviors. And if it was a new drug that came on the scene today, I don't think we would legal legalize it. We would be writing laws to make that illegal right now. Right? So it's uh, funny to think about that. Okay, I'm just gonna move this on. Okay. Uh, just, I think people are probably well aware now, but the overdose crisis continues to escalate in Ontario, uh, across the country and North America. Um, we've seen opioid overdoses go up and there are the numbers there. It really, they've been going up for over 20 years though, it really started escalating in around 2016. And um, I don't know what those numbers would look like if we didn't implement some of the harm reduction strategies we have like the lots on distribution, safer consumption sites. Um, but despite our best efforts there, the numbers continue to escalate. And it's not because we're not, it's not because harm reduction isn't an effective uh, strategy, it's because we're not tackling the root causes of the issues. Um, it's not just deaths though, uh, this comes from Public Health Ontario, it's on the hospitalizations, it's emergency department visits, it's a EMS, it's huge strains on the healthcare system. It's, these are just opioid numbers here, but it's not just opioids. And uh, a week or two ago, uh, we did a webinar with Katie and I encourage you to look at that, where we haven't been talking about stimulant drug use enough and we haven't been addressing smoking and inhalation. We've really been focusing on injection drug use. So I encourage you to go look at that webinar as well. So really it's not an opioid crisis we're looking at. It's not just an overdose crisis. It really is a drug policy crisis. Um, in Canada, uh, drug laws are regulated at the federal level and we're beholden to certain international drug treaties. Um, but it's interesting that healthcare is a provincial responsibility. So there's a bit of a push and pull between the federal and provincial um, uh, governments there. But if we're going to change things, it needs to be done at the federal level. Uh, drug prohibition laws, as they are written, are not based in any evidence or science. They were rooted in colonial, racist, and classist social attitudes. So a lot of people think that cocaine and fentanyl and heroin are dangerous and, that, and we've uh, made them illegal because they are dangerous. But in actual fact, um, they're more dangerous because they are illegal. Um, we, people can use those drugs recreationally and, and in, in ways that don't harm them. Um, it's hard to believe that for some people because the stereotypes and the images we see are of people in treatment or in jail or severely addicted, but people get severely addicted to alcohol. And so uh, there's lots of stereotypes and, and assumptions that we need to challenge ourselves around. The application of the drug laws has been significantly disproportionate towards indigenous and black communities. So there's the laws there, but that they were rooted in racist and, and colonial and classist attitudes, but uh, the application of the law has been uneven as well. Uh, prohibition does not address demands or reasons for people to, uh, that use drugs. And uh, despite huge investments in drug interdiction and policing and courts and prisons, we've never stopped the use in the, or the supply of drugs. And actually, uh, prohibition is driving this toxic, illegal, and unregulated drug supply. Um, and why is that? Well, suppliers prefer easier to produce drugs. So, for example, we used to have people growing fields of poppies to make heroin and transplant, uh, transporting bricks of heroin around. It's a lot more easy to, to have a few chemicals in a lab and ship some highly potent powder around the world. We're starting to see local production of fentanyl in Canada now, too. Um, when we ban the precursors on drugs, it hasn't stopped the demand, so we find new ways of making them or new substitutes, and often those are more toxic and, and drugs that we haven't ever used before. 
And we've been through this in the 1920s with alcohol prohibition. People were drinking quality beer, then we prohibited it, and we started seeing toxic uh, um, moon, more concentrated moonshine. Uh, so, uh, we quickly realized that uh, we developed a toxic supply there and we had Al Capone and gangs. So we stopped that experiment, but we've continued it with the other drugs. Uh, this is just a list of all the drugs that are showing up in the Toronto drug supply now. And if you want to take a look at the, the report there, this is from the Toronto Drug Checking Services. You can't read that necessarily on the slides right now, but there's a link in the slides that you'll get. Uh, just have a look at what's showing up in the supply. It's never ending and it's escalating. The other impact of prohibition is, and, or the criminalization is that it creates this attitude that, you know, people who use drugs are these immoral people and they're doing illegal things. Uh, and that shapes the language and the attitude, the approaches, where we're going to fund programs and services. Um, so we've put a lot of money into police and courts and prisons, and we've got a huge housing crisis right now. Uh, people don't get access to mental health supports. Um, so could we be looking at shifting some of the resources? The criminalization also creates internalized stigma. So people uh, may feel shame and not worthy of supports. Uh, they can't talk openly and honestly about what's going on in their lives. Um, and they become isolated and, and fearful. And I, I think about the um, work around gay men, particularly PNP and the stigma associated with crystal meth and how hard it is to reach some of those guys. Um, this is a lot to do with just stigma. Um, the Canadian Chiefs of Police, um, they uh, estimate that someone with addiction, I'm not sure how they're defining that, but someone with addiction is spending on average $120 a day on their drugs. Um, I know one of the injection sites in Toronto at Street Health, I asked them one time, these are people coming in to inject drugs, they were estimating people are spending two to $5,000 a month on their drugs. How are people affording this? Um, the drug prices are artificially inflated because they're criminalized, um, but it often means people are resorting to sex work, shoplifting and break and enters. And this, this isn't because they're bad people, it's what they're having to do to survive and get through their day. So we're criminalizing uh, other behaviors as well as a result of their drug use. Uh, and criminal records can impact uh, access to social services, employment and travel. So a lot of people are realizing this dis isn't working. Uh, who's calling for decriminalization? This is not everyone. These are just some of the highlights. But uh, the Canadian Minister of Health has an expert task force on substance use. And here are two reports they've recently put out uh, looking at alternative models to, to uh, criminal penalties. Uh, we've had the uh, Canadian Associations of Chiefs of Police. These are the, the top level police chiefs are now calling for, for decriminalization. And if you didn't see it this week, TVO had a, a series and there's a link there to an interview with two of the chiefs of police um, and talking about the need for decriminalization and even access to safe supply. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health, there's a link there to their statement, but again, calling for, for decriminalization. Um, and uh, more uh, just back in August, the Drug Users Liberation Front, so this is a group of people who use drugs in Ottawa, have actually submitted a request to Health Canada for what's called a six, Section 56 exemption. So the drugs in Canada are regulated under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. There is a provision within that that allows the Health Minister, minister to give an exemption where simple possession would be uh, decriminalized. That has not made its way through yet, hasn't been approved, but it's been submitted. Um, this is a podcast uh, on CBC Front Burner where I was interviewed along with another uh, chief of police uh, and talking about a bit about Toronto's uh, work around uh, decriminalization as well, uh, because the city of Toronto is about to submit an application. So what are some of the different models for decriminalization and regulation uh, and what are we talking about? Um, before we do that, it's important to remember that drugs are, there's nothing inherently illegal about a drug until we write a law that makes it illegal. And if we look back to 1901, heroin was widely used as a cough suppressant. You could go into a pharmacy and just buy it. There was nothing illegal about it. Uh, in 1908, we wrote laws around opium and made that illegal. Uh, but it wasn't because the, the drugs were inherently dangerous. This was about who was using them. And it was uh, you know, uh, Chinese workers on the railroads and social control of a particular population. 
we could undo some of those laws or rework them. So as I said, uh, in Canada, there's three main legal approaches to, to regulating drugs, uh, and it's all uh, under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, but we have legalization. So criminal sanctions are removed. Uh, there are regulate, regulatory controls that can still be applied as with alcohol, tobacco, nowadays cannabis and prescription drugs. So you may be able to uh, access them through storefronts uh, online or through uh, medical um, prescriptions. We criminalize uh, other drugs, so that includes the production, distribution, and possession of controlled substances, um, and you get criminal records. So for now, cocaine, crystal meth, and heroin, fentanyl would be examples of that. Although fentanyl is also a prescription drug, it can be used in certain medical situations. Uh, and then we have decriminalization. So uh, there's no specific drugs that are decriminalized in, in uh, Canada, really, but there's um, some Section 56 exemptions, which uh, allow for the injection sites. And there's de facto decriminalization in many jurisdictions, which is really up to police discretion. So in some jurisdictions, it's rare that police will actually charge anyone for a simple drug possession these days. Uh, so we have uh, some decriminalized spaces now in, in Canada, uh, and injection sites are an example of that, where when you are on site, your, your, your simple drug possession is decriminalized and you cannot be charged for, for possession of drugs in, within those spaces. Um, that allows people to come in and talk openly and use in safe spaces, but again, it hasn't addressed the, the toxic drug supply, um, and it doesn't mean that you still can't be under the threat of some kind of criminal prosecution. Um, and if you have existing or previous drug charges, we still, you still have those uh, over your head. We also are starting to play around and experiment with what we call safe supply. So giving people alternatives to the toxic unregulated supply. So giving people prescription, prescription drugs. These are very small pilot projects. They're not scaled up to where they need to be. And they've typically focused just on opioid drugs and, and not stimulants or other types of drugs. So this is the spectrum which we could be thinking about if we're looking at what are we going to do differently. Uh, on the one hand, we could have extreme criminalization, uh, and there are places in the world that do that. If we look at the Philippines and Duterte, who's running things there, and that just literally killing people for using drugs. Uh, and then we could step it, step it all, you know, there's a spectrum here. So do we incarcerate people, or do we just uh, give them penalties, or do we give them warnings? Um, and then we can move towards sort of a, more of the legal side of things where maybe we have cooperatives or buyers clubs where people who want to use drugs get together and make and produce them. Um, or maybe we have regulated retail of those drugs or we could have actual full blown commercial production. Um, and that's what we see with alcohol and nowadays uh, cannabis where we've actually commercialized those, those drugs. Uh, all of this though, we really want to think, you know, on that spectrum there, what are we trying to do? Uh, we, and, and we need to think about the social and health harms and trying to find that sweet spot. Um, and I think the models that we have for most of the drugs are too far in terms of the uh, prohibition end of things and, and the social and health harms they're creating. But I think models of alcohol and now cannabis have probably moved it too far in terms of promoting it. So why is it that I can walk down the street past an LCBO and have samples handed to me on the sidewalk? I don't think that's always the best model of, of uh, um, legalization either. One of the models that has been tried and not often looked to in the world is the Portugal model, where they decriminalized the simple possession of, of all drugs in, about, in 2001. And as a result of that, we saw huge in, uh, decreases in drug arrests, incarceration, more people got into treatment, although some of that is uh, mandated treatment, and there's concerns with that. But we've seen huge reductions in deaths, uh, reductions in HIV, and no major increases in drug use. Uh, it's not a perfect model. Um, the uh, architect of that plan talks about the biggest impact is the reduction of stigma, though you're no longer considered a criminal. Uh, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, though, have some criticisms of that model, so I'm going to let you read that report there. Um, and uh, here are some of their main points in terms of uh, decriminalization is okay, but we need full decriminalization because in, in uh, Portugal, you still have to uh, attend treatment in some situations, you're still forced into to, um, changing your behaviors. 
there are thresholds in terms of how many, how much drugs you can you can you can uh, carry. And the concern with that is that we might actually move people from simple possession charges into trafficking charges, which actually further criminalizes and more severely criminalizes people. Uh, I'm going to skip this uh, just to get us on to a couple other slides. I got a couple minutes here. Um, in terms of Canadian opinions on this, the Angus Reid Institute has asked Canadians about these four most discussed strategies. So a criminal justice approach, getting tougher on people, supervised injection sites, decriminalization of all drugs or compulsory treatment programs. Um, it's nice to see that uh, there's actually quite wide support now. The majority of people are supporting supervised injection sites. 59% of people are supporting decriminalization. Um, there are still a lot of people that think we need to get tougher on this. Um, and then the biggest support is for compulsory treatment programs. Uh, and that kind of makes sense. You can see why people think that, but there's real concerns around that because compulsory treatment just does not work. Um, it's also, uh, if we're thinking of drug use as more of a health issue, we want to be careful that we don't over-medicalize drug use it's not, and, and make it too public healthy. Uh, there's a spectrum of drug use. People use drugs for all sorts of reasons, um, and there can be beneficial use just as much as there can be harmful use. So not all drug use equals addiction. Not everyone needs help or treatment, and a forced or mandated treatment is not effective. Um, so in the end, uh, you know, right now we should be decriminalizing, I say, the possession uh, uh, of all drugs to, to shift the, the stigma, scaling up harm reduction services, uh, particularly around the top and uh, introducing safe alternatives to the toxic supply, looking at different models of treatment and scaling those up. But ultimately, we need to sort of completely end the war on drugs and, and look at some legalized model, but that does not have to mean with, that we commercialize drugs. Um, and I'll just say everything has to be done with the involvement of people who use drugs. Um, if it's not, uh, we will create uh, policies that, that aren't effective and will not work. Um, that's my uh, contact info. I will, um, there's a lot more resources and readings and viewings that I'll send out with the slides. So I'll just leave it at that for now. All right, thank you so much, Nick, uh, for that really helpful overview of uh, different policy options around uh, drug decriminalization. And I think it's just uh, especially important that we sort of elevate our literacy around like the issues um, around sort of different policy options. So thanks very much, Nick, for your ongoing work uh, in that regard. Um, so our final uh, panelist, Today uh, is Ryan Peck, uh, who is uh, the executive director and lawyer with the HIV AIDS Legal Clinic of Ontario. So uh, please take it away, Ryan. All right. Thanks much for including me. Uh, thanks to all the speakers before. It's uh, I, 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 a real honor to be on the same, uh, <laughs> same panel as you and a uh, pleasure to be talking with everyone. This goes till 2.30 and we want to have some questions at the end. So I'm going to do my best to keep this to 10 or so minutes. Um, so what, you know, why don't I just keep it to 10 minutes? Um, so please shut me up in 10 minutes, right? Like pull, pull out the hook, please. Uh, so uh, for some time, uh, Canada's had you know, just a, a really brutal distinction of being a world leader in criminalizing people living with HIV. Uh, it's also the the only known jurisdiction to use aggravated sexual assault to criminalize uh, folks with HIV. And things are getting better. Um, they're still real ugly, but they are getting better. I'll get there in a moment. But they're, they're, people are still being prosecuted when there's no allegation that HIV is actually transmitted. Like right? this crime is not about only transmission, it's about exposure to HIV. People are still being prosecuted where there's no intention, right, on the part of the person living with HIV um, to engage in a behavior that results in onward transmission. And finally, there's still prosecutions when the sexual activity in question poses negligible to sometimes zero risk of HIV transmission. So there's a deep, deep overcriminalization, And HIV remains more or less the only medical condition being criminalized. Uh, generally, when the state involves, gets involved in responses to risk transmission of medical conditions, they, public health authorities get involved. Um, 
uh, sometimes in a deeply, deeply problematic manner. Uh, we don't have enough time to talk about how public health authorities get involved. Um, but um, generally, it's a public health approach um, and, and not a criminal law approach. When it comes to HIV, there's two layers of state involvement, right? Public health authorities and the criminal law. A handful of other STIs have been criminalized, so we're aware of some herpes-related charges, a hepatitis C-related prosecution, but this is real dated. It goes back to 2001. It was thrown out of court. A hepatitis B conviction, but that's almost 15 years ago now. So the action is really around HIV. There's been at least 225 prosecutions since 1989. And the height of this, in terms of number of prosecutions, uh, was 2004 to 2014. And that's when we saw 10 to 15 cases per year. And we've seen it gone down since then. Now, 2020 and 2021 are wildly difficult and you know bizarro years, right? So I, things went down in the years after 2014, which is fantastic. But remember, we can't only measure the negative impacts of the law simply based on the number of prosecutions, because the law gets used in all sorts of really difficult, um, disturbing, and uh, harmful ways. So for example, uh, people who are engaging in abuse use the law right, to further the abuse. If you don't continue to do what I want you to do, I'm gonna go to the police and tell them that you, um, uh, that you didn't disclose your HIV status. There's you know, all sorts of negative consequences associated with this law, even for folks that have not been or will not be prosecuted. Um, in terms of the, the trends, uh, in terms of demographics, you know, like groups of people being charged, most, you know, more than half the cases have taken place in what we now call Ontario. Um, between 2012 and 2020, uh, and 2012 is a magic number because that's when the Supreme Court of Canada last spoke to this, almost 40% of people charged for whom race is known are black men. And we know that this very unfortunately fits the pattern, right, of over-criminalization of black men more generally. Um, and there's really concerning trends around indigenous women. Um, of the at least 22 women who have faced charges, at least 33% are Indigenous. So, you know, the numbers are still small. You know, a social scientist would say the numbers are small, but the trends are really, really concerning. And um, my apologies, when, when I refer to men and women, I'm referring to cis men uh, and cis women. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, trans, non-binary folks have been caught up uh, in prosecutions, we need to get a better handle on demographics. Um, I'm just uh, very, very briefly where the law is at today, and then hopefully where we're going to go shortly, because we're at a moment right now where we hope, and when I say we, uh, you know, people living with HIV, you know, some I, I, a broad coalition of people uh, and organizations um, are hopefully going to be engaging in the next round of reform activities. People have been fighting back. People with HIV, um, academics, activists, lawyers, um, aid service organization staff, uh, for years and years, right? Since, since, the, since the 80s, and really since the Supreme Court of Canada spoke to this for the first time in 1998. And what the law says now, in short, um, if anyone is interested in, in a more robust discussion of where we've come from, where we are, and where we want to go, you know, I'm more than happy to show up anywhere, more or less anytime, as are my colleagues at HALCO. So don't ever, ever hesitate to reach out to us, please. Um, but what, where the law stands now is that People can be uh, pro convicted of an aggravated sexual assault if they do not disclose their HIV status before engaging in behaviors that pose a realistic possibility of HIV transmission, right? 
And what that means, uh, or when, when the Supreme Court defined realistic possibility, they made clear that the only sex that does not pose a realistic possibility, and therefore the circumstances where one does not have a criminal law duty to disclose, a sex that takes place when, uh, when the person with HIV has a low enough viral load, uh, the Supreme Court indicated 1,500 copies of uh, virus per milliliter of blood, and, excuse me, and a condom is worn. Um, this was a really difficult decision, and from our perspective, uh, the Supreme Court took a considerable step back from where the law was more or less at or heading, and that's um, that there'd be no criminal law duty to disclose if a condom is worn or if someone has a low enough viral load. But that's not where the Supreme Court landed. Since the Supreme Court made its decision in 2012, there have been changes, however. In 2016, uh, the then Attorney General, Minister of Federal Minister of Justice, explicitly acknowledged that people with HIV are, are overcriminalized and promised to study this issue. That was, a, you know, a, that kicked into action people with HIV, number of groups and individuals working on this issue. And uh, the feds released a report uh, in 2017, uh, which had some very helpful stuff in it. And also on the same day in Ontario, the provincial government released a policy which made clear that people living with HIV with a viral load of under 200, right? So there's all these different numbers floating around. There's the 1500, which is low, based on the Supreme Court. There's undetectable, which uh, depending on the tests in use in different jurisdictions around the world, could be under 30, could be under 40, could be under 50, uh, but then they're suppressed. And suppressed is really undetectable. When you see that U equals U slogan, they're referring to under 200. So what the prosecutorial policy indicates in Ontario is if someone has an a suppressed viral load, viral load of under 200 for more than two months, sorry, for more than six months before the sex act in question, there's no duty to disclose, okay? That's really important for, for, for all sorts of people. It's not enough because we know that for all sorts of structural reasons um, related, you know, economic reasons, uh, uh, colonial base reasons, racism, it's very difficult for all sorts of folks to get to suppressed. So it's really important that the law does not only allow people who have a suppressed viral load to get out of trouble, right? Um, so the broader HIV community got together and landed on a consensus statement, a consensus approach to where the law ought to go. And this is back now in 2017, and based on broad consensus across what we now call Canada, the position is that the law ought to be removed from the sexual assault realm. So not use sexual assault, and it should focus on only on behaviors, on intentional and actual behavior. So when people with HIV intentionally, and in fact, actually, here's the, um, we're hoping that over the next few months, we will continue discussions with the federal government. When I say we, I'm talking about this large group of people who are working on this um, um, to get us to that point where we get re things removed from sexual assault and focus on actual and intentional. And the Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization just finished, like literally last week, a cross, a cross country consultation on this issue. And we'll, once we wrap, once the coalition wraps up uh, the, um, finishes the last little bits of that consultation, puts the numbers together, there will be communication and hopefully a mandate to move forward in a particular manner. Uh, I will stop talking now and I'm happy to address any questions, thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan, um, and thanks for trimming your time down a little bit just to make uh, time for 
uh, some Q&A um, with the audience and also the other panelists, uh, those that are still around. Um, this is a, sort of a good time to sort of circle back to sort of anything uh, that you wanted to sort of raise about the other panelists presentations. Um, while folks are sort of thinking through um, the presentations and uh, thinking about the questions that we want to ask, um, definitely encourage you folks to sort of weigh in. Um, Greg, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. So we do have a question here for uh, our last speaker there, Ryan. Um, so the question comes from Kiro, and Kiro asks, even though the policy to not criminalize people who have a suppressed viral load for non-disclosure is in effect, have there been any more cases of criminalization of people with suppressed viral loads? If so, how is that being handled right now? Yeah, so uh, not for some time. So there's, this is not the case, th this prosecutorial uh, policy is not in, in force in every province. There, in, in, in the territories, there is a federal directive, which echoes this. Um, in Quebec and in British Columbia, there is a policy. In, in Alberta, there's a letter, which there's an effectively a policy. In Ontario, it's still possible that the police may knock on the door or give a shout to someone living with HIV who's had a suppressed viral load for, for more than six months. And that might take place when uh, the complainant, right, in, in, in the, um, in, 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 I'm using criminal law language, when the HIV, the sexual partner goes to the police and says, you know, I just learned that this person I sex with two weeks ago is living with HIV, they didn't tell me, you know, I want you to pursue this, investigate this. And it is considered a crime. The Supreme Court has laid it out on numerous occasions that's a, that it's a crime. And so if the police decide to investigate, the investigation should cease once the person with HIV demonstrates that they have a suppressed viral load. There still is this, this really difficult point about whether somebody has arrived at a suppressed viral load based on medications or whether it just happens naturally, right? Um, my apologies if I'm using outdated language, but people used to refer to, you know, that, that subset of people who somehow are naturally immune, you know, as long-term non-progressors or elite controllers. Um, and so it's not entirely clear what would happen with those, with that group of people, um, but people have not been prosecuted in Ontario for some time now in the suppressed viral load situation. Uh, thanks for responding to that, uh, Ryan and, that's a relief to hear um, uh, that, that that's the case. But of course, as you noted, you know, uh, the impacts of criminalization sort of go even beyond just like the actual prosecutions and, um, and convictions, you know, and just thinking about the way that criminal law is used and weaponized against um, different folks in our communities. And, you know, as we sort of heard from you also, especially black and indigenous folks. So thank you uh, for responding to that. Um, other questions? Yeah, we do have another one coming in there from an uh, individual named Dane. Uh, Dane asks, and I believe this is again to, to Ryan, again, reminder to folks that all of our, our speakers are able to answer any questions that you do have. Um, but the question is related to Ontario Bill 281, which would be uh, titled Christopher's Law, and is related to the change to the sex of, uh, offender registry list and disclosure. Um, so it has the potential to disclose one's HIV status if it passes assent. Um, what can all populations do or um, priority population networks do to prevent this bill from passing? Um, so this is for Ryan, but uh, Dr. Dryden, please feel free to chime in. Yeah, so we've been fighting back on uh, various sex offender registry issues associated with criminalization for some time. Um, because the the because the conviction for the most part is aggravated sexual assault, there is a provision uh, in, um, uh, in law that states that there's mandatory registration on the federal and provincial 
on the federal registries. And there's also um, a registration on the provincial registries. This issue is actually going to the Supreme Court and HALCO is going to be there to try to make it such that uh, a judge has discretion so that it's not mandatory. Um, that doesn't entirely fix things because this new amendment in Ontario, um, which we are looking at along with some other human rights organizations, you're right, does have the potential to disclose someone's HIV status in the sense that um, if people dig in and look at the circumstances relating to the offense, it could become clear that the person was convicted of an HIV related offense. They would not be, or I have to take a closer look. I'd be shocked if right on the registry, you know, it's not gonna say HIV right beside there, but you're right with some digging, somebody who wants to find out can. Um, we'll, we're going to be releasing more information about this once we have a chance to dive in. The last time we looked a few weeks ago, it was um, it had not been referred to the to the committee that uh, that speaks to this provincially yet. do know that we're approaching the end of the time here so I am going to pass on one more question quickly this one is for Nick um, uh, and again from individual uh, from Dane Griffiths um, so question for Nick uh, you mentioned more attention needed on harm reduction and drug decriminalization for stimulants stimulants like crystal meth are high on the list of drugs we report using what are you hearing or seeing with regards to safe supply overdose and crystal meth for for gay men uh, unfortunately, we don't have good data on gay men specifically, uh, even the, the coroner's office is really hard to, to know who's gay and who's not when they're examining a dead body. Um, they're working to improve that. What we do know, though, is more generally stimulant deaths are uh, on the rise. I, back in 2017, we were in Canada, there were 4,000 opioid deaths, but 1,000 stimulant related deaths. Um, in terms of safe supply options, those are more targeted towards um, street involved uh, folks. Um, and there have been some um, smaller programs looking at prescription stimulants, such as Ritalin or Dexedrine, which are pharmacologically almost identical to, to crystal meth. Um, but we haven't seen widespread uh, safe supply programs for, for stimulants yet. Um, in terms of harm reduction strategies, um, uh, the concern around gay men is that traditional harm reduction programs sometimes are a barrier to, to, for, for gay men to access those sites. Um, and as I said, the, the PNP community specifically, it's hard to reach. I think the, the focus on peer networks, peer training, peer outreach uh, is where, where it needs to be at. Uh, thanks so much, Nick. And I'm just realizing that we're almost, we're basically at time. Um, I did want to ask Dr. Dryden, I don't know if you can stick around for one minute. I just had one sort of quick question, just so that you're included in this Q&A part. Um, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on the sort of much anticipated um, um, brief that Canadian Blood Services is expected to submit to Health Canada at the end of the year um, and maybe just to sort of share any other sort of thoughts or expectations what you're looking to see in in that submission mm -hmm. um, I think Canadian blood services will do the bare minimum um, that's pretty much what they've done from now they've actually done worse than that so this is kind of the bare minimum um, I don't I don't expect it to be um, I don't expect to really see any kind of accountability around um, anti-Black homophobia or anti-Black transphobia. Uh, they've been pretty adamant that they're not interested in doing that kind of work. Or if they do it, it's um, pretty much, it is performative, it is about a performance, this kind of claim to, oh, we're listening and learning. And as we all know, um, listening and learning is just really an excuse not to take action or take effective action or to hold, hold oneself accountable. Um, having Canadian Blood Services kind of um, assess themselves is pretty much like having police oversight boards investigate police. It's not going to provide the kind of outcomes that would lead to any kind of uh, structural sy or systems um, change or disruption. Uh, what we all know is that Canadian Blood Services could have made this uh, submission 
years ago. Um, their claim that, you know, it's Health Canada, it's not us, uh, is, um, is questionable, uh, to say the least. Uh, the other thing we do know, in 1997, when uh, Health Canada created Canadian Blood Services, the role of Canadian Blood Services was to educate the Canadian population on what makes a good donor, what makes a sound donor. They had an opportunity at that point in 1998 to say this is why we're focusing on behavior and to use this time to really transform blood donation in Canada, to have um, uh, sexual health services on site, to have testing on site, uh, to train people uh, around why we're asking if you're having under unprotected anal intercourse or underprotected vaginal intercourse. Are you partnered with, are you having sexual, uh, sexual encounters? In, uh, what does Jada call it? Uh, entanglements with more than just one person, right? Like we could have done that at the beginning. And I argue, and I stand by this, I would actually put money on it, that if they had done that in 97 and 98, um, we would not be in this blood shortage and deficit that we are in now. And so um, the only way that Canadian Blood Services can do something st strategically different is get rid of their entire board and actually um, appoint a board that's more um, reflective of those most marginal in our communities, sex workers, folks who are houseless, folks who um, uh, use, you know, huge drugs, who are drug users in a variety of ways. Um, you know, those of us who are in throuples, who are in whatever, who are doing like lots of fun sex shit. Like this is what, this, this is who the board should be. Graham Scherer makes close to $700,000 a year, and he's the one that shepherded where we are today from 98 to 2001. This is not supposed to be a lifetime appointment, so he needs to go. And then we need people who do science, who understand that um, how to do science in a decolonizing way, in a way that centers decolonization. Someone like Dr. Chandra Prescott-Weinstein. So this is what we need if we want an actual um, a uh, system change to blood donation, one that centers um, those most marginal in our communities um, to have a more robust uh, blood process. Um, and so, and your guess is as good as mine. If, <laughs> if Patty Hyju is interested in doing that, or if any of the health ministers in our provinces and territories are interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much for that very powerful sort of response. Um, I know that we're over time. Um, so I want to just take a minute just to thank all of our amazing panelists and sharing their work uh, with us today. So um, thanks to everyone for joining in for this discussion. It will be recorded and shared so you can access it afterwards. Thanks, everyone.